Yeah, for me, um, one story that stands out is, uh, you know, she had a profound devotion to the Blessed Sacrament, to the presence of Christ in the Eucharist, but she combined that with a deep love for the poor. And so she would challenge the other sisters by saying, look, we encounter Jesus sacramentally in the Blessed Sacrament, but there's also this profound encounter of our Lord waiting for us um, in those, you know, who are on the streets, who are dying. And so there's, there's actually accounts of her like em- embracing particular individuals at Mass. And those, those two parts of her life were never divorced. Her love for Christ and the liturgy and her concrete care for, for the poor. Yeah, and for me, you know, she can stem and go so many ways. She famously, um, you know, gave a Nobel Prize speech. Um, she spoke in the face of, uh, you know, the United States president at the time and uh, said things that the, 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 that standing president would not have appreciated. And she's yeah. this diminutive woman who, in the context of speaking to world leaders, um, it's not that she didn't have a filter, it's that she was not worried about, um, you know, as we'd say in Oklahoma, greasing the pig. <laughs> she just let people see the pig. Yeah. Um, so she was willing to go up in front of the microphones and say what needed to be said, but also have such care for the poor in Calcutta. I mean, we, we all know how most people end up with AIDS. But she's not asking these people, yeah. why do you have AIDS? Why do you have this? Why are you in this situation? Why are you in the gutter? Why has everyone abandoned you? She just went there and took them from the gutter and was with them until they died. Yeah. And could see the continuum of those actions and everything in between as one simple movement of obedience to Christ. And so I think it makes a lot of sense combining what we both said, yeah. that she doesn't think these things are unrelated. The willingness, you know, she has a famous story, don't have to go into, about um, receiving um, the Eucharist on the tongue, but the same reason that she thinks it's important to receive the Eucharist on the tongue to be fed by Christ is the same way that she feels like she should receive whomever he brought into her life, into her arms. That what seems like being passive was actually this strength and activity that could move the entire world. And that the same thing with the cross, which in one way is the ultimate sign of death and defeat through the the providence of God is the ultimate sign of victory and power. And her willingness to not break asunder any of those things was precisely the source of that strength, that victory. It's maybe a little lesser known, but she also had a great sense of humor um, I was hearing a, a priest speak once of meeting Mother Teresa, and the nervousness that he felt when he was going to meet her, he wanted to say the right thing, and he was curious about what she would say to him. So he was in the chapel uh, where the sisters, um, where, where they would go to Mass there in Calcutta, and he saw Mother Teresa approaching him, and he was, you know, he had that anxiety. And I guess she came up to him and whispered in his ear, Father, you're in my seat. And so she had this real, you know, in the midst of, of facing a lot of great suffering and, and just stark poverty, she maintained a, a real strong sense of humor. The best one that I heard, um, so uh, I, I think he's told in public, so I think she should be fine, but Archbishop Jacobs of our uh, uh, sister archdiocese in Dubuque, he was the bishop of Wichita, and so he famously um, would tell this story when I was there too. He was in, I think he was in Calcutta, but wherever he was, he was with uh, missionaries of charity, and, and Mother Teresa was there, and she asked him to um, preach either a mass or just a, you know, a, a reflection. I forget which it was. So he's all geared up and he's really excited to go. And he starts preaching at the sisters. And he notices in the back the Mother Teresa's leaning against the wall taking a nap. <laughs> so she's tired. <laughs> she does a lot. And so he said that, like, even taking a nap, Mother Teresa was <laughs> able to teach him about the importance of humility. Yeah. I, I think there's different ways that we talk about or think about happiness. So there's happiness in the sense of just like subjective feelings, like a surface level happiness where you can actually produce it through al- alcohol or drugs, for example. And, you know, there's ways that you can have feelings of happiness. And sometimes 
it's clear that Mother Teresa didn't have those. There's a deeper understanding of happiness where a person recognizes that they've attained the purpose for which they were created. And I think Mother Teresa clung to that. And, and Dewey, the quote that you bring up, for me, that's another testament to Mother's humility. In a certain way, people from a variety of backgrounds could do heroic things or self-sacrificial things. And we can certainly look at the lives of persons who are outside the Christian faith and admire some of the works that, they done, that they've done. For Mother Teresa, though, it's not simply that, uh, for her, I think, that she fulfilled certain acts, that she served among the poor. But that quote to me stands out in that she's saying, like, I'm in this constant awe, or, for, you know, for her it was humbling, that God would be, that God would call someone like herself to be a co-creator, to be a co-laborer in the kingdom. Well, you were talking about Boethius, so I'm thinking of a long line of um, philosophers that write a lot about happiness. So Aristotle, Boethius, Thomas Aquinas. And common to all of them is to point out that happiness, and, I mean, they were blessedness, uh, maybe is a better word for yeah. it. Um, that what makes that possible is, like you said, being who we truly are and disassociating that from things that happiness simply can't be. So for instance, wealth can't make us happy because wealth is not done for itself. Wealth is only used to get other things. Um, honor or fame can't make us happy because it depends on others. Pleasure, which I think, you know, the word happiness in English denotes both pleasure, but then also this deeper sense we're talking about. But pleasure can't ultimately make us happy because how fleeting it is. So if you want to talk about the fact that um, the feeling of pleasurable happiness um, eluded Mother Teresa. I think that's actually absolutely true. Um, and I think we need to be honest about that. If you dealt with the Calcutta slums your entire life and were, you know, cheerful, like in a <laughs> cartoony way, you're a psychopath. Uh, like, you have really profound problems if you're just like yippy skippy about stuff yeah. after seeing that. Yeah. Um, but she was talking about something different, and it was much more in line, Aristotle, Boethius, Thomas Aquinas. Jesus. Yet, yet to have Jesus is to actually be fulfilled and to be blessed, even though as the eight Beatitudes point out, right, yeah. the blessed, they're gonna do things like mourn. Yeah. That that, that, that mystery, that near par paradox, calls into to question what we assume happiness is. Yeah. The, all the things we say will make us happy, are going to go away. We, we say you can't take them with you, but you can't even keep them now. Yeah. I mean, like, I was pretty happy at the beginning of this interview, but it's dragging on at this point. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I like that you used the phrase blessedness, and I think it does go back to the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. comforted. There's a way where those who laugh and are partying and are living it up, as Jesus said, they've sort of received their reward. Like, their reward is is immediate, but those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, there's an expectation for something even greater. So ministering in the slums of Calcutta, you know, to everything there, there's its time. And I think Mother Teresa properly had a, you know, a certain kind of grief in the face of the human circumstances that had created that poverty. And yet she was grounded in a deeper blessedness. And of course, you know, we use the phrase when a saint dies that they went to their reward. I think you could certainly say that in the case of Mother Teresa, that we ask for, for her intercession, that we might have the same kind of faithfulness that she showed while she was uh, present among us. Well, and the, the final thing I'd say about that is there's a way in which if like, you're getting a fix off of religion, yeah. like prayer makes you feel, you know, that sort of sentiment or pleasure, um, it's just as bad as any other thing that's going to leave you high for a little bit and then go away. Mm -hmm. um, religion is not just like, you know, a proper, uh, you know, goody two-shoes fix you can have. If it's a fix, it's just like any other fix. It's impermanent and it's not for the ultimate right reasons, which is why Mother Teresa had this desolation. Yeah. Because she didn't want the fix. She wanted the real thing. And so here is the, the ultimate paradox that's so beautifully demonstrated in Mother is that many of us see that degradation in Calcutta and the, the victims who are suffering, and we would say, like, why 
why God, why did you put me here? Like, it's too much for me to bear. And Mother Teresa had joy because she said, why God, why did you find me worthy enough to share in your suffering and minister to you? And that's, that should, like, convict us because I don't always feel that way. I hardly ever feel that way. But can you imagine getting to that point where you felt thankful to be there in Christ's suffering and his poor and felt grateful that you were asked to minister to Jesus Christ himself? Mm -hmm. And we can say that here in these nice green comfy chairs with air conditioning. With air conditioning. Um, but man, what a, what a call and a conviction that in, in our circumstances of our life to be called to try to imitate yeah. that.